Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this beautiful Halloween day to the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium here in the two Mississippi museums. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones. I want to make sure you know about a few programs we have coming up. At noon next Thursday, the Manship House Museum will host a free program on the history of United States restaurant culture by USM Prof Professor Andrew Haley. Uh, longtime history as lunch attendees may remember, he did a program for us several years back. He's great. That will be all kinds of fun. As you know, there's not quite as much room at the Manship House as there is in this auditorium, so they do ask if you really plan to go to give them a call and reserve a spot. They'll make sure you have a, a place to sit. And then as we head into November, the department has three Veterans Day related programs coming up. Next Wednesday for History is Lunch, Jeff Gambrone will present Mississippi in World War I on Friday, November 9th at 10 a.m. in the Nancy and Ray Nielsen Hall of History, just outside here. We'll have a program to honor Mississippi veterans and commemorate the 100th anniversary of Armistice Day. That program will include a performance by the 41st Army Band, recognition of veterans in attendance, a memorial volley and wreath laying, and a keynote speech delivered by Major General Jansen D. Boyles, the Adjutant General of the Mississippi National Guard. Afterwards, both museums will offer free admission to military veterans and a family member. So I hope that you'll be able to join us for that. Then the following week, we'll have Joe Wise as our History's Lunch speaker to present Above the Trenches, Mississippians in the First Air War. Today, though, we are delighted to welcome back Peter Miazza to discuss his new book, Voices Heard from the Grave, Lives and Stories of People Buried in Greenwood Cemetery. And after this program, at 1.30, we will uh, have a walking tour that Peter will lead at the cemetery. So please join us for that. Anyone who is interested, we will meet at the little white wooden building there. Peter Barmiaza was born in Jackson, a graduate of Central High School. He went on to attend Mississippi College before joining the United States Navy. For 30 years, Miazza lived in the San Francisco Bay Area while working for Pacific Telephone and AT&T. After retiring, he moved back to Mississippi, where he has been active in the Greenwood Cemetery Association. And I should mention that all proceeds from the sale of this book, which is available over here, go to benefit that organization, which works to help keep up Greenwood Cemetery. Help me welcome Peter Miazza. I hope I got the, yeah, I think you can hear me. I had to make sure how to slide this microphone on. I'm not used to it. But Chris, I want to thank you for letting me participate in today's Wednesday is lunch program and to be able to talk about my book, Voices Heard from the Grave. The last time I spoke about Greenwood Cemetery, <clears throat> And this program was a number of years back before they had this beautiful auditorium. Back then, we were crowded into a little room, and, and people had to stand and back if they were able to get in here. So this is a tremendous improvement, and we, we thank everybody in Mississippi who had anything to do with the construction of it. I think uh, Chris is probably displayed a certain sense of humor by scheduling a program on the cemetery on Halloween's day. <laughs> now, I've given uh, a number of talks on Greenwood Cemetery over the years they, uh, to different groups, civic groups, and other kinds of people, genealogical associations. and. Uh, we started off with 35 millimeter slides, and then we progressed over to PowerPoints. And so it's, it's, been a, it's been a lot of fun, but this is the first time I've been able to talk to anyone about my book. So I certainly do appreciate this. My uh, association with Greenwood Cemetery goes back many, many years. Now, all of my paternal great-grandparents are buried in Greenwood Cemetery along with their family. And I think every time I look around the cemetery, I find somebody else 
that I am related to. When I was a young fellow, visiting the cemeteries to uh, remember the family's grave there was a common thing. And I remember that one of the most uh, delightful things we, that I did, uh, and a lot of every other, other children, was to visit the grave of the little dog. And the story that has been handed down is that little Mamie Sims had a constant companion who was a little dog. And unfortunately, up in, we were living up in Oxford at the time, she came down with typhoid fever and died. And she was brought down and buried in Greenwood Cemetery. And Excuse me. <laughs> this thing won't stay on any better than my hearing aids do. <laughs> but uh, she was buried in Greenwood Cemetery, and the story goes is that her little dog refused to leave her grave. And he mourned her, and eventually he died of a broken heart. And the family, in memory of that, raised the... Uh, uh, small statue of a little dog lying prone. And that dog is still in the cemetery, and on the front cover of the book, on the dust cover, there's a, a picture of the little dog. Now, this is a story that we tell every time we have a tour. If anybody else has a better story, I would like to hear it. <laughs> before, I wanna, before I start talking about the book, I'd like to say that the cemetery has been a passion for me for almost 25 years. And it started with me trying to study my family history, even out in California before I retired. But uh, gradually I became so involved that it became almost an all-consuming hobby. Once I was, I was uh, working there, I was wearing my new expensive hearing aids. At least to me, they were expensive. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, when I got home, I found that I was missing one. And I said, oh my gosh. So I went back down to the cemetery and started looking. And I looked and looked and looked. I couldn't find it. So then, in desperation, I went and got a metal detector. I thought, well, it's got a little bit of metal in it, so maybe I can... Uh, I can uh, find it with a metal detector. Well, that was unsuccessful too. So I went home that evening and uh, I was uh, bemoaning the loss and I, was t I talked to my friend, good friend, John Michael Chudy, who's sitting back here, and uh, told him about it. And he said, don't worry. He said, we'll go down there after dark and find it. He says, all we gotta do We'll take a couple of LED flashlights and we'll shine it on the ground and oh, we can, they, they were reflective easy, won't have any trouble. So that night, we went down to the cemetery and at night, now you imagine, you got two men in the cemetery with flashlights going around like this. Now if, if the police had come by, they would probably run us in. But anyway, we, we tried that for about 30 minutes and with no luck. Finally, I, in desperation, I just sat down and started worrying about it. And he came over and he said, Have you, you, were you any other place in the cemetery except where we've been tonight? I said, no, I don't think so, except I, I did sit down on this bench yesterday. And he looked at me and he said, get up. And then he signed his flashlight under there and bore a hole there with my hearing aid. <laughs> I've spent a, a lot of time researching Greenwood Cemetery, but have, I've never been able to find out why it's named Greenwood Cemetery. I know that there are a lot of cemeteries named Greenwood. It seems to be very common, but why particularly this cemetery was named, I have never found out. But if anybody knows, I'd like to know. Uh, and that reminds me of uh, uh, what happened. <laughs> okay, Cecile.
Good. Thank you. Problem solved. Uh, while we're talking about the name of Greenwood Cemetery, reminds me of uh, an incident that happened one time. I, uh, I enlisted the help of uh, a young man to go down and help me do some work in the cemetery. And uh, as we were driving down into Jackson, he looked at me like he was, I thought we all, I was crazy. And uh, now he, he was, when he worked, he was like a tornado. He could do in three hours what it would take me three days to do. So that was the reason I asked him. But on the way down, he kept looking at me. And finally, he said, you don't know the way to Greenwood. Finally, dawned on me. He, was, he thought we, he was from Delta, and he thought we were going to Greenwood. <laughs> now, that happens even today. A lot of times when we mention Greenwood Cemetery to anybody, the first thing they think of is Greenwood, Mississippi. But regardless of the origin of the cemetery, I'm very happy to report that the, well, we've come a long way towards resolving some problems that have been caused by uh, neglect and storms and, and even vandalism. Greenwood Cemetery volunteers have spent many, many hours in the cemetery trying to restore it to a place of beauty so that anyone who saw it would be envious of being buried there when they die. <laughs> but I guess not too soon. But uh, most of these improvements, I must say, have been attributable to uh, Cecile Wardlaw. He's sitting right back here. And it gave us a, the reason we have Greenwood Cemetery in the name. She is the executive director of Greenwood Cemetery Association. And her only reward has been the satisfaction of knowing that she's helped to make downtown Jackson a much better place to visit. Now the upkeep of Greenwood Cemetery takes a lot of time, effort, and also money. And all of us involved would like to join in anybody that's here that isn't a member of the association would like to help us, we would be more than happy to have you come join us and help out with the thing. And to the end of the money, as Chris has already told you, the profits from the sale of book, the books, they all go to the Greenwood Cemetery Association. Now, sure, admittedly, it's only a drop in the bucket of what is needed, but at least it's a little bit. Now, if anyone has any suggestions on um, uh, improving the cemetery, uh, raising money for the cemetery, I'm sure that Cecile would be more than happy to hear from you. <clears throat> Most of you are probably aware that Greenwood Cemetery is on the National Register of Historical Places. It's impossible to know how many people are buried in the cemetery. <clears throat> As you drive in off of George Street through the gates and getting Kim, toward north, you, as you pass and you look to the right and left, you, you wonder why there are no graves, no markers. But there are only a few of them. But as you f go further on north, you find out, and to get into the new part, you find out there are a lot of markers. Now, Henry Daniels created, made this map of the cemetery in 1865. Now, mind you, that was right after the Civil War ended. And uh, when he made it, he divided the cemetery up into the old section and the new section. Now, the new section was, it would, had just been added, and it was when the state gave uh, the uh, land for the cemetery, they reserved this section six north to be included in the cemetery. So when the old cemetery got filled up, then this was open here. And he, he went in and he divided this up into sections and lots so that uh, it would be able to put, put uh, names and keep good records of it. 
Now, he said that the old part of the cemetery down here, that there were, the, all the, the graves are just in helter-skelter, just everywhere. And he said that he wasn't even able to designate walkways or pathways because the graves were, have, have already been, uh, uh, there were, he knew that there were graves there, but the markers and everything were just gone. So, so we, we realize that uh, time takes its toll as the, if, if the, uh, as the markers probably fell over, and a lot of them were probably made of wood and any other material that you could find. And gradually, when they fell over, the ground would come over and it covered it over. Uh, I guess that's probably not uh, too uncommon in old cemeteries because people, a lot of times people go out and they try to find old cemeteries and they find that the markers are covered over and they have to pull them up and try to find them. Agree with cemeteries the same way. There was a, uh, a marble slab that we found a, a few years ago, and uh, what, it, what, what happened was a f uh, young fellow up in New York called me and asked me if, he could, if I could get him some help trying to uh, give him some information on his, uh, on his Phelps family because he was trying to write a book on, on them. Now, the, the Phillips family was the family of uh, the treasurer, treasurer of, uh, Green, of, the, of the state of Mississippi for a while. And when he died, he was buried in uh, Greenwood Cemetery. So I, I agreed to uh, try to help him. And when I went out to the cemetery, I found that uh, uh, the treasure, uh, Phillips' grave was beautiful. It was built up about this side, and it had a large marble slab on top. And it, it was in great shape. And uh, there was a space next to him. And then there was another marker that was his, their son, uh, Colonel Seaborn Moses. And so I, I went back. And I started looking at the uh, state records for uh, his wife, who was Sarah Collins Phillips. And incidentally, she was uh, a sister of one of my great-great-grandmothers. Like, just about half of the cemetery is already. <laughs> but uh, after, after studying what I could, I, I determined that... Uh, she had to be buried next to him. So the next time I went out, I carried a prod, and I started trying to look around, and very quickly I hit something and uh, pulled back grass and weeds, and there, there was a piece of marble. So I went back and, and got a shovel and started cleaning off, and there, there was her mark, her, uh, her monument was on the ground. It was, it was all fractured into pieces. So I went and had a, uh, a, a concrete slab poured, and then we, pushed, we put the pieces on that slab, just like putting together a crossword puzzle. And lo and behold, her marker was identical to her husband's marker. That's, uh, that shows you how some of the... Uh, uh, Markers can be lost over time. And another case was their, their son. They had a son, William, who was born, who died during the Mexican War down at Buena Vista. And apparently he was brought back and buried in Greenwood Cemetery because his, their other son was a, a colonel in the Confederate Army, and he, he was... Uh, in charge of the 10th Mississippi down at uh, Pensacola. And he, he came down with uh, what the, the, his family said was uh, appendicitis. And he knew he was going to die. And so he wrote a letter to his sister. And he said, 
when I die, I want to be buried beside William. Well, if you want to be buried beside William, and his marker was in the Greenwood Cemetery there, then William had to be buried by him. So I went back to with a, a probe again and started probing, and lo and behold, I hit a hard casket and was, got the outline. So we found out where William was buried there. And here he was, a veteran of the war with Mexico. So some graves may not have ever had a marker on them. And so I, I guess uh, Greenwood Cemetery, I don't think, is, any, is not unique about that. Because uh, a lot of cemeteries have problems with their records. However, the uh, Greenwood Cemetery, we were fortunate that uh, at one time, I think it was about 1860, John Logan Phillips went out to the cemetery. Now, he was a, uh, uh, a, a civic leader in Jackson before the war, and he was also a native of Ireland, and he was a newspaper editor. So he went out to the cemetery and went around and and copied down the names and the dates on all the existing monuments. And he published those in a book, little booklet he called uh, something about the uh, Jackson, a little booklet about Jackson in advertising. And copies of that, there's a copy still in the uh, Eudora Welty Library, and there's one, I think, is one at the archives next door. So those records we have, which are some of the oldest oldest records we know about. And then uh, later on, uh, of course, when the war started, all the sections records were destroyed, just like the rest of Jackson was, courtesy of Grant and Sherman. Then the, uh, after the war, when the, they tried to reconstitute the records, they went out and uh, did the same thing that Powers did, later years and made a record. But these unfortunately burned again. And then in the 1930s, the cemetery people went out and did the same thing. Now those records we still have. About 1941, an LDS couple, a Mormon couple, came to the cemetery and they recorded all the graves in the cemetery and the dates and they, they typed them up. They didn't have computers, and they typed them up and even used carbon paper. Who knows what carbon paper is? <laughs> but uh, those records we, we have also. Now, Dr. Mary Landon, another one, she, she is uh, uh, a brilliant engineer. She worked over in Vicksburg on the Corps of Engineers, and uh, she is interested in genealogy. And she went around to all the cemeteries she could find in Hines County and recorded the inscriptions. And those she put in a little book called the, uh, uh, something about the cemeteries of Hines County. And how she ever, how she ever did it, I, I don't know. But uh, there, there were, uh, uh, another person was Betty Wilshire, and she spent a lot of hours down at the uh, archives here going through the old newspapers looking for records of marriages, deaths, and births. And she put those, she's put those into books, and I think there's about five or six books that she's written. Now, excuse me. We do have some existing sextants records, especially from around 1970, 1871, for about uh, 10 or 15 years. And there, there are a few other records earlier. Uh, uh, the earliest one I've been able to find was one from uh, April the 9th of 1847. So putting all of these together, we, we have a fairly good knowledge of how many people are buried there, and the name. Of course, unfortunately, 
The second section's records, all they did was say such and such died, such and such was buried on this date. But they didn't say where they were buried. So who knows? And uh, in uh, on April of 1867, the, the ladies of Jackson were getting word to go to the uh, cemetery for the annual, third annual uh, Decoration Day Memorial. And before that happened, a, uh, a reporter from the Clarion Ledger went to the cemetery and recorded all the dates, names and dates on the wooden plaques in the Confederate burial ground. And I think he, he probably found about 500. And then he published those. Those were published in the Clarion Ledger uh, of that date, I think it was about April, April 27th. And fortunately, those records still exist. And uh, what he, he said, he, he mentioned, he said, these, these wooden slabs are going to rot away. And somebody better get out and replace them. Well, his admonition fell on deaf ears. And the, the slabs were gone. And then uh, about 1929, the, uh, the VA was allowed to provide monuments for Confederate soldiers. And so they were uh, ordered for Greenwood Cemetery, the veterans there. But nobody knew where they were actually buried. But we knew they were buried in, in that plot of ground, but exactly were. So the, the monuments were just put in a uh, arbitrary fashion. Not only Union soldiers buried in Greenwood Cemetery, but there were also some uh, Union soldiers buried in different sections. And uh, after the National Cemetery in Vicksburg was open, all the Union soldiers were dug up and moved over there. They didn't want them fraternizing with the Confederates. <laughs> but it, was, it wasn't until 1901 that the last one was, was moved. And not only that, but we also at one time had a uh, Union general buried in Greenwood Cemetery, General uh, uh, George McKee. And after the war, a lot of, like a lot of scallywags, he just had to stay down here. And uh, he got involved in politics doing Reconstruction and then uh, uh, had a, uh, bought a plantation out in Madison County. And he was instrumental in uh, helping Tugaloo College get started. And eventually, of course, like the, all the rest of us, he died. And he was buried in Greenwood Cemetery. And his wife and his two daughters moved back up to Washington. And uh, years later, after she died, the daughters had her buried in, in Arlington. And then they had his body exhumed and moved up to Arlington also. Now, if anyone is trying to find the location of a grave, I, the excellent place to get started is find a grave. We have one of our members, Linda Robertson, who's done an excellent job in research in the Greenwood Cemetery and putting the names of people in to find a grave. And not only the names, when she finds an obituary, she puts that in there and she puts a lot of other information. So she has done a tremendous job and she really helped us out a lot. Now, of course, the, the real reason I wanted to be with you today and not talk about Greenwood Cemetery, but to uh, advertise my book, talk about it. And for a number of years, I was privileged to conduct tours of Greenwood Cemetery. And when I first started out, we, we just had a brief outline. We knew that such and such was buried here, and from his marker, he was born and he died. Well, 
it became apparent pretty quickly that uh, that didn't cut it. I had to, we had to find some more information in order to make the tours more interesting. So I spent, spent uh, many, many hours in the uh, library, the archives library, going over the old records and uh, some family records over there and, and uh, getting many headaches from trying to read the microfilm over there. And, and then I uh, also uh, had to went around to different places I went to out of the state. I've been to, I've been to many uh, old courthouses and I, I went in, out to uh, Hines County Courthouse. You know, uh, when uh, in the early days, the courthouse for Hines County was out at Raymond. And all the old, all the records up until 1872 were out there. Now, when I went out there trying to find the records, the, uh, looking for state records for my great-grandfather, it was a big cardboard box and everything had been tossed into it. And the records were like that. But uh, fortunately, a few years ago, uh, some uh, Mormon people came out and took all those records and sorted them out in envelopes and uh, put them in boxes and indexed them. I, I tried to uh, find out some other information on people, but uh, uh, one of the, uh, I guess some of the people that helped me, one was, uh, especially I remember, was Mrs. D. Hyland. Now, she lived over in Yakana, just south of Vicksburg, and her family uh, was somehow connected to uh, the family of Judge William Lewis Sharkey. Now, I think a lot of you probably know that Sharkey was uh, the governor of Mississippi at the end of the Civil War. He was appointed by uh, President Johnson, and uh, he served for probably about six months. But he, more important than that, he was the Chief Justice of Mississippi for, I think, 22 years, which, which is quite remarkable. So he had a, quite a reputation. But uh, she had uh, inherited, uh, somehow the family had gotten a lot of Sharkey's notes and uh, his portraits and pictures and even some of his furniture. And she was gracious enough to allow me to come in and let me examine everything she had. And gosh, she even served lunch to me. <laughs> but uh, she brought down... Uh, some old plantation books that, that Sharkey had. And Sharkey uh, made a notation in there that he had uh, instructed the, his overseers to make sure that, uh, that his slaves were well treated and received needed medical attention and were not abused. And for some that may have been a little bit different, but he was, um, I guess you'd call it enlightened at the time, now, over a, over a number of years, I've accumulated uh, quite a few uh, file cabinets full of information that I've been able to find. And when I would take people out to the uh, cemetery for tours and uh, having uh, tried to improve uh, what, this, what I told them on the tours, I was often asked if the stories were available in a book form or anything, anywhere. And when I replied in the negative, uh, I was sometimes uh, encouraged to go ahead and put them in there. So I, uh, I got to thinking about it and finally decided to do it. And I started to try to select stories that I hoped would be uh, interesting for people. And it took me probably about five or six years since, since I'm, not, I'm not a dedicated writer, in fact, I'm not a writer at all, and, and as you probably could see, I'm not a public speaker either. But most of the items that I had, uh, things I had written about were just plain old letters, and that was in the days before we had email. But uh, after I got started, my, my good friend, um, Grady Howell here, every time he saw me, he would say, How's the book coming, Pete? 
<laughs> trying to pull me along. And then uh, my, uh, another friend, Paulette French, who had written the book on, on the 10th Mississippi, she did the same thing. So with uh, encouragement like that, I had to get started. But at first, I had to, I had to find a format to print the book, and I found a program called uh, Book Design Templates, which, which certainly served my purposes. But the most difficult thing was trying to determine which stories to use. So I, I tried to find some cross-section of people who are buried in the cemetery, and ones I hope would be of interest to people. And at, at first, I omitted any, any stories out of, um, out of about my family, but um, a fellow by the name of Ed French, he, he was very interested in family, and for some reason, he was interested in the Spangos, so he encouraged me to put my family in there, and I did. And for that, I'm, I'm grateful because uh, a lot of us, not a lot, but a number of my Younger family members have read the book and they've learned about the family that they would not have known otherwise. But after I got it into a printable format, then I had to find a publisher. And at that time, the head of the University of Mississippi Press indicated that she would be interested in publishing the book. Well, uh, I, I gave it to her. And she went over it, and I um, guess like a lot of writers, I got a rejection slip. <laughs> and I don't know, I don't know why, but I, I said, well, maybe I'm not politically correct. But uh, knowing that Grady Howell had self-published, I think, almost all of his books, I decided that was probably the way to go, especially since... Uh, Talking about Greenwood Cemetery would probably have a limited interest around in the Jackson area. And Paulette French helped me connect with uh, a publisher by the name of McNaughton and Gunn up in Saline, Michigan. And uh, incidentally, the, uh, which would be popular today, the, uh, the publisher is owned by women, and they're women and they run it. But I can't say that. Getting the book published was a, uh, was a pleasant experience. <laughs> it, was, it was a struggle. But finally we got through and we got the book published and all. And then the, but the cost of it didn't break me. I think it was, it was around $15 a volume. So then we had to decide how much were we going to charge. And I had already decided that any profits from the book would go to the Greenwood Cemetery Association. So uh, we, we finally decided that probably $25 would be a good price. And at $25, that meant any time I sold a book, the association would get almost $10. So at least uh, anybody that buys a book will have the satisfaction of knowing they are helping out with Greenwood Cemetery. Now, I'm pleased to say that one of the stories had, a, had already had a positive reaction. As I, reserved, as I researched over in the archives, I kept going across the name Peter Barr. And that intrigued me because my given name is Peter Barr. Uh, but uh, I tried to find out whether the families were related, but they were not related. The Barr family in the cemetery, they were from New York City. What it was was there, there was a, uh, a father, James Barr Jr., I mean James Barr Sr., who was a uh, stonemason marble maker up in New York. And he had three sons. He had James Jr., and he had John, and he had Peter Barr. And they all were in business with their father as marble makers. Well, after the uh, family decided for whatever reason moved south, the father went to New Orleans and opened up a shop down there, and the three brothers opened up in uh, Jackson. 
and they had a marble works down on South uh, State Street. After a couple of years, Peter Barr decided that he would move down to New Orleans and join his father. And he turned the business over to John and Peter Barr. Now, when you uh, drive into Greenwood Cemetery, come through the main drive, you come to a, a circular drive. And on that circular drive, there's this tall, beautiful monument, and that was carved by the Barr brothers. And uh, I, I don't know how many other monuments out there. We don't have any records of others that they carved. That's the only one we know that they actually carved. But uh, when the Confederate, when the uh, Civil War came along, uh, John and James uh, joined the Army, and they closed up their business. The uh, James Barr ended up at one time uh, following uh, Phillips and as the uh, colonel for the 10th Mississippi. And <laughs> I'm getting the signal that I'm talking too long. <laughs> that, that, that reminds me of a joke that was, we had when I, was a, when I was a kid. There was a, uh, a preacher in a church, and uh, he, he was probably long-winded. And he, after talking for a long time, uh, preaching for a long time, he told the congregation, he says, he said, uh, I don't have a watch, so I don't know how long I've been talking. One of, the, one of the parishioners held their hand up and said, there's a calendar on the wall. <laughs> but anyway, when, uh, when, when, uh, uh, the, the John uh, when James James died over in, in uh, Macon, Georgia during the war, and he was buried in the Rose Hill Cemetery over there. And uh, uh, after the war, his his wife had him uh, exhumed and moved and buried in Greenwood Cemetery. Well, of course, at that time uh, she was destitute, and the only little mark of, on his grave was a little cube about like that, and it had a, uh, apparently it had a vase of some time on top of it. Then uh, uh, years went by, I guess, and the uh, cube must have slunk down. Well, when I was researching, trying to find uh, where James Ball was buried in the cemetery, I found record that he was, he was actually buried there, and that, uh, so it, it only stand to, grow, to uh, reason that he would be buried next to his nephew, Stilly Barr. So probing around there, I, I found this, the, the little square was, the only thing you could see was the top of it in the ground at that time. And we dug it up, and there was his name on the side of it, James Barr. And uh, when I wrote about that in the, in the story in the book, my good friend Robert Murphy, he was incensed that there was a, a Confederate officer in Greenwood Cemetery that didn't have a marker. So he went out and had one uh, made for him. And I, I got a call from him last night that he has placed it up there on the grave and will be putting it in position sometime later on this week. Now, I guess I, I better start winding up here. Uh, I've, I've got enough material here to keep talking all day, but <laughs> so I'll, I'll just, uh, well, I'll, I'll wind up, I, uh, let's see, I want to, I'll always wind up my talks on the Greenwood Cemetery by reciting either Benjamin Johnson, or Benjamin Franklin's uh, statement about cemeteries or William Gladstone. But Gladstone said, show me the manner in which a nation cares for its dead, and I will measure with mathematical exactness the tender mercies of the people, their respect for the laws of the land, and their loyalty to high ideals. And one of these days, you'll be able to go down to the farmer's market 
and get greenwood honey. Cecile found out that there was a, back in Washington, D.C., in the Congressional Cemetery, they have beehives on some of their uh, tombs, and they grow and sell honey. So now, Greenwood Cemetery has a hive, and uh, we had, had some honey last year. And so this, this is going to be a big money raiser, we hope, one of the day. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you more, much for your attention. Now, if, if anybody has any questions or anything, I'll be more than happy to uh, hear, especially if you've got any suggestions how we can improve the cemetery, raise money, or else. I'd be more than happy to try to answer you. And before we actually get to the questions, I'd, I'd be interested to see by a show of hands, who in here has people buried at Greenwood Cemetery? I know there are some for sure, so a fair number of you. Anyone with a question, if you raise your hand, we'll bring it to you. I don't remember where I heard this, but as during the Civil War, <clears throat> it, as it became apparent that the Union forces were going to take Jackson, uh, some of the records uh, held by the state were uh, farmed out to uh, uh, more or less remote courthouses throughout the state to protect them because it was realized that they would probably be lost lost if they were uh, when the Union forces did take Jackson. And I wonder if any of the Greenwood records might have gone there. That, that, that is certainly a possibility. I, uh, I, I've never heard of anything, but I would, I would hope that uh, if they were there, that somewhere, somewhere along the way would find them. I know that the, uh, the Confederate records, service records, were hidden in the, uh, in the uh, city hall up on the third floor among where the uh, Masons had. They were, they were protected up there, hidden up there after the war. Uh, any other questions, anything? Yes, I have a question. Um, hold, hold your mic up there, please, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, my understanding was that during the Civil War, you had um, slaves who fought for the Union Army. And you also had slaves, some slaves, who fought for the Confederacy, fighting with their masters, their owners. They fought with their masters and owners, so they fought with the Confederacy. What I'm asking is, these two sets of slaves who fought for the Confederacy and the Union Army, were they, were they buried there in the Greenwood Cemetery? Do you know? Um, yeah, um, Cecile? Uh, Greenwood Cemetery was, was integrated from the very beginning because it was the only cemetery in town. Um, the, the slaves had no monuments that we know of. We haven't found any. The oldest African-American monument that we have recognized is 1865, and we firmly believe that that was a former slave who was buried in the cemetery and given a monument since he was then a citizen or a free man. Um, there have been rumors that slaves were buried at the foot of masters, and we have absolutely no proof of that. We have done um, ground penetrating radar surveys over a large part of the cemetery. So we know that there are over 300 unmarked graves and probably many of them are African Americans. But because we don't have any written records, we can't identify them. But um, no, as far as I know, there was no designation after the war of who had fought on which side of, for African Americans. Peter, you might want to mention that there, there is a website Thank you. <laughs> did, did everybody hear that? Uh, Bill says that a, a uh, website, Greenwood Cemetery of Jackson, on the website there. So uh, if you have any information, there's a lot of information on that website. Anything else? Okay, Grady.
Um, are you on the board of the people who chooses like who can be buried there, like for the Mississippi? I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I was looking at Grady. <laughs> Sir. Um, for the Mississippi Legends thing, you know, where they allow certain people to be buried there, um, are you on that board of the who chooses, like, who can be buried there in the, that well, part of the uh, cemetery? Uh, Greenwood Cemetery, all of the, all of the uh, uh, burial places are a fill. We, we don't have any vacant burial places. People are buried there if, if, if their family already had a... Uh, a plot, and so they're buried in their family plot. And uh, uh, just Saturday, uh, one of Cecile's relatives was buried there. And uh, there is a plot for uh, uh, Governor William Winter. Eventually, he'll be buried in Greenwood Cemetery. But uh, that, that's, I hope that's answered your question. The cemetery was declared full in 1909. <laughs> but of course we didn't stop burying people then um, we do have family plots and one of our great hopes and um, goals for the cemetery in the next few years is to build a columbarium so that we can accommodate new families because we feel like that would be very appropriate for this special place Pete many many years from now uh when it's your time to cross over the river and rest beneath the shade of that old <laughs> magnolia i hope they put a little monument up to you without that with that prod like <laughs> moses <laughs> <laughs> you should have used that prod looking for that hearing aid the first time <laughs> other questions Website is Greenwood Cemetery Jackson dot org. Cecile said, "Wasn't that what I said?" Any other questions? Ah, thank you. I know that you are overly extended in just your duties to Greenwood Cemetery, but are you of assistance to others? who have a similar quest at other cemeteries to, uh, do you offer any assistance as to how you did it, how they can do it too? I'll let uh, Cecile answer that. If Cecile, can you? <laughs> are you um, looking for ancestors or are you trying to restore a cemetery? <laughs> because um, I don't do research. I, I restore cemeteries. I, I can talk to you about that and would be happy to do that. Linda Thompson Robertson is very um, willing to discuss with people how she has, has done the research to find all these people who are buried in, in Greenwood Cemetery. And the latest thing is newspapers.com. She's looked at thousands of obituaries and, and found names from that. But yeah, I'm, I've got a card. You can come see me and I'll. <laughs> Any others? Well, absent that, a reminder that copies of Peter's book are available over here for $25 a piece. He'll be happy to sign that for you. He will be here for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll pack him up and we'll head to Greenwood Cemetery where he will lead a walking tour. We'll meet at 1.30 at the little building there the summer house thank you all for coming today i hope we see you next wednesday help me thank peter for this week